Hi again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm and I don't like to apply pesticides in my garden. I don't think I'm unique in that. I think most gardeners, uh, all other things being equal, would prefer never to have to strap on the backpack sprayer, throw on a face mask and spray harsh chemicals around their yard. They would prefer to, to have the pest populations low without having to use the pesticides. Is there a solution like that? The answer to that is yes. There's a whole science in horticulture called integrated pest management. It's just a short way of saying, do everything else you can before resorting to the use of pesticides. And one of the big cornerstones of that is biological diversity. Uh, it's planting things in your garden, planting plants in your garden that will help you to avoid the need for pesticides. What they do, those plants, uh, is they bring in the beneficial insects. They support and, uh, and attract the beneficial insects in your garden so that as the pest populations go up, also the predator populations go up and they balance out. And you may never be entirely pest free in your garden, but it may be to the point where you can tolerate it. That's one of the, uh, one of the ideas of integrated pest management is choosing a tolerance threshold. You can say, I can let there be a few aphids in my garden. I can let there be a few uh, leaf hoppers flying around without having to freak out about it because I know that the beneficial insects are there. So I talked about this recently on the Rose Chat podcast and that, uh, that interview came out today actually. I'll link it down below. For those who come here for rose related advice, the Rose Chat podcast is an excellent resource for this. And so I wholeheartedly uh, uh, encourage you to have a look at uh, their interviews uh, obviously with me but also with a bunch of other experts that they bring on to talk about everything related to roses one thing I talked about on that Rose Chat podcast was four families of plants that I really recommend uh, that just round out the the beneficials within your garden the four families I talked about is the carrot family the mint family, the mustard family, and the sunflower family. And I know they all sound like they could go in a recipe. Those are the representative edible members of those families, but they have a huge diversity within each of those families. And I wanna talk about some of the coolest members of those families that you can add to your garden. Stepping into the sales shed for a second here, I'm selling seeds and I say down below it, make this claim, companions for roses. And why did I pick these ones as companions for roses? And it has to do with the same concept. These all offer diversity within the garden. You can see mint family, but also uh, alyssum, really, really well known. And that's in the mustard family, really well known for bringing in beneficials into the garden. Uh, down here, daisy family. Uh, I wonder if I have anything from the carrot family in here. Maybe not so much right now, but there's another one from the mint family. Uh, this isn't in one of the families mentioned, but it's a great beneficial attractant. Brings in lots of hoverflies. And so when I say great companions for roses, I mean, yes, I want to grow them. I want them to look good in the garden with roses. I think they, they, uh, they are great ornamental companions, but I'm choosing them also for the amount of diversity that they bring into the garden as well. I'm going to start off with the carrot family, full well knowing that there will be some people who watch this video and give me heat over recommending something that self seeds so readily all over the garden. An example of that would be my first choice. This is Sweet Sicily, which has ferny foliage and tall, stately white flowers, gorgeous, and attracts so many beneficial insects to the garden. It's, uh, in fact, those umble flowers, those, uh, those umbrella flowers of the carrot family or flat top flowers are so numerous that they do a great job of attracting this. Well, this is the reason why they self-seed so readily. They have so many flowers. Um, the fact that the carrot family uh, spreads this way and spreads very uh, successfully, I don't think is an environmental problem. I think it's part of its use or value in the in in nature is that it spreads into waste places very very quickly and it fills that ecological niche. Uh, that being said, uh, when I recommended Ravenswing and Thriscus last month on another video, people said, ah, oh, that's a weed. Well, it's a native in Europe. Uh, I, I, this whole issue of uh, something being invasive or something spreading easily, it is something we need to acknowledge, but have a mature conversation about it, knowing that the carrot family also is extremely valuable in the environment. Um, that said, there are some varieties that I can recommend here that are more ornamental and don't spread quite so easily. Uh, in this case, I'm going to talk about this Eryngium. Um, 
I think that's the way I would pronounce it, Erangium. It's a sea holly, and it has these steely blue flowers. I'll put a picture up on the screen as well uh, that, uh, that just makes it uh, look like nothing else in the garden. So I love it. Another one that I like to recommend an awful lot is Astrantia or Masterwort, and I'll throw some pictures up of that as well. So the carrot family is a great resource, and they particularly bring in the parasitoid wasps that do a great job of fighting aphids early in the season. Next up is the mustard family, and the mustard family does something special as a purpose in the garden, is it starts to bloom early in the season. Right now my roses are just leafing out for the season and uh, of course there's no other flowers, there's no other biological diversity in the garden, so you need some of those early season bloomers to attract the beneficials in early while it's still cool outside and the mustard family loves growing in when it's cool. Obviously the mustard family includes all of those veggies like broccoli and kale and cabbage, uh, but it also includes some ornamental flowering members that bloom really early in the season and fill that gap. One of them I'm going to say right up front is Iberus or Candy Tuft. Uh, there's the white version of perennial Candy Tuft. There's also some other versions that are purple and are also quite ornamental. I'm growing one of those this year for sale. Uh, second one I'm going to talk about is Arisimum or Wallflower. Uh, just a stunning showy flower that blooms from the bottom up towards the top and just keeps on blooming. So it's, it's fantastic. Uh, there's also some ones that I would consider a little bit weedy as well, but I love them. I let them self-seed in the garden. Maybe I'll get a shot here of Lunaria or money plant which I love to let self-seed and it grows into this tall stately plant uh, with uh, with beautiful flowers of course big blousy pink or white flowers uh, but then is followed by these coin shaped seed pods that get transparent over time uh, gorgeous in the garden uh, rock cress is another one I'll mention here uh, orinia which has uh, shades in blue or pink traditionally maybe some purple as well uh, but just again a wonderful landscape filler and a perennial and uh, works great for attracting the beneficials early on. I mentioned alyssum earlier is one of the classic plants for bringing in uh, beneficial insects. It just blooms super quickly as an annual. You can seed it, it grows quickly, it blooms fast, you can do it in the spring. I would do it again in the fall. It doesn't really do well in the heat of summer and that's maybe something you could say uh, across the entirety of the mustard family is that they don't particularly love the warm weather, but in the cool spring and cool fall, they're fantastic fillers to fill those gaps in the season. Thinking of the daisy family, you might pick some of the obvious choices, things like Gerbera daisies and Shasta daisies and sunflowers. So I think I called it the sunflower family before. So all of those definitely in the daisy family and all wonderful additions to the garden, uh, ben benefiting all the pollinators as well, particularly the bees. But uh, I will also talk about some of the ones that are not so obviously daisies. Let's talk about Liatris or Blazing Star. This is a classic florist bulb that uh, comes up. It uh, has these beautiful uh, lavender or white flowers traditionally and uh, just blooms wonderfully and uh, I love the spike shape on it as well. Uh, next one I'll talk about is Joe Pieweed and Joe Pieweed uh, might be quite tall in the garden actually. I've seen it grow up to six or seven feet tall with these big clusters of flowers across the top. You can get the more dwarf versions but I like the big bold statement of, uh, of Joe Pieweed in its full size. And finally I'll mention the humble goldenrod which is a yellow flowering Roadside weed, actually. I, I don't know. Do I like roadside weeds? It seems to be a running theme here, but I do like things that are easy to grow. And goldenrod contributes beautifully to the garden, and there are more refined versions of it available in the garden centers. It takes kind of a reputation hit. People say that they are allergic to goldenrod. They see it blooming at the side of the road at exactly the right timing that they are also getting, you know, ragweed and other pollen allergies. But goldenrod is not a common allergen, uh, so you can set that your mind at ease on that one but again uh, so many flowers on that plant at a given time and it blooms over such a long period of time that it is always bringing plants or bringing beneficials into the garden. One last one that you might not think of as in the daisy family is the common yarrow or achillea and that comes in a wide range of colors. I love it and uh, definitely worth a place in the garden. Finally up, let's talk about the mint family. The mint family is aromatic, almost uniformly aromatic. If you rub the leaves, you get that scent. And people credit that with confusing the pests. 
I'm not sure, but they does seem, uh, the studies seem to support that it does attract the beneficials into the garden. And some of them in, in the mint family are the classic companions to roses that I would recommend the most often. Things like bee balm, which comes in a wide range of colors. It's uh, often pink or purple or sometimes red. Uh, and uh, again, gorgeous and wonderful for bees and, and other pollinators. Uh, talk about salvia. Salvia is just such a diverse genus. Uh, and some of the salvias that I grow with my roses are tall and spiky and just uh, do what the lavender, which is another member of the mint family, would do, but they grow in the conditions of roses just a little bit. They suit those conditions a little bit better. Uh, catmint is another one, usually in white or light blue, uh, but catmint is another one that associates gorgeously with roses. I couldn't go through the mint family without mentioning my favorite, Agastache, or the uh, sometimes they call that the root beer plant because of the scent of the leaves. So Agastache, again, in a wide range of colors. I'm growing a yellow one this year, but I also grow the blue one in the garden. It comes in, in hot, hot red colors as well. So just, it's a real diverse plant that, uh, that can fill those gaps in your garden. Now I've mentioned those four families and I think they're definitely worth mentioning, but that being said, you know, the key word here is diversity. It's, uh, it's uh, if you're looking for some of those early bloomers, you could look for that in the borage family as well. Uh, and, you know, just take down these names of families, go on Wikipedia, find out what the members are and then see what the ornamental members are. And those ornamental ones, the ones that have been uh, bred or selected for use in the garden are the ones that are most likely to give you a show, but also most likely to have flowers on them at all given times throughout the year. Uh, I will say this as a final parting note here is that if you stuck through the video this far and you're not interested in roses, it should be cluing in by now if you're a veggie person that this uh, same assortment of flowering plants is just as essential, e maybe even more essential for your success with veggies because veggies uh, are fast growing plants that do a great job of attracting pests themselves. Like they'll get overrun by aphids and everything else very, very quickly. And because they're growing so quickly, they tend to be fertilized so, 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 uh, so much by gardeners. Uh, there's a lot of food there and a lot of ways that pests can thrive very, very quickly. So if you don't have that background, that surrounding of the flowering plants that stable that stable base of predators already established you can let you can get your pest uh, populations out of control very very quickly in veggie gardenings all right thanks for watching today if you have any questions about this topic please drop those in the comments below the video and i'll see what i can do to help